Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and certified informational privacy professional providing practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Hello, I'm Justin Daniels. I am a shareholder and corporate M&A and tech transaction lawyer at the law firm Baker Donaldson advising companies in the development and scaling of technology. Since data is critical to every transaction, I help clients make informed business decisions while managing data privacy and cybersecurity risk And when needed, I lead the Legal Cyber Data Breach Response Brigade. And this episode is brought to you by Red Clover Advisors. We help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, e-commerce, professional services, and digital media. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more and to check out our best-selling book, Data Reimagined, Building Trust One Bite at a Time, visit redcloveradvisors.com. Well, today we have a very special episode. Am I going to introduce our guest first and then we explain the episode? Or you explain the episode and then I introduce our guest? Why don't you introduce our guest and then I'll explain the episode. Okay. So today we have Chris Voss, who is the CEO and founder of the Black Swan Group, as well as the best-selling author of the book, Never Split the Difference. If you have not read Never Split the Difference audience, you must go grab a copy, of course, after you listen to this podcast. Chris has used his many years of experience in international crises and high stakes negotiations to develop a unique program that applies globally proven techniques to the business world. Prior to 2008, Chris was the lead international kidnapping negotiator for the FBI, as well as the FBI's hostage negotiation representative for the National Security Council's hostage working group. During his career, he also represented the U.S. government as an expert in kidnapping at two international conferences sponsored by the G8. Well, Chris, it is a uh, true delight to have you on the show today. So welcome. Uh, Thank you. I apologize. You had to go through all those acronyms and the alphabet and the government alphabet, all that stuff. Yeah, happy to be. I had to use my brain working very well today. I had my good cup of coffee. (laughs) So listeners, before we get started today, you might be thinking, why do we have a ransom negotiation discussion? And the reason we're going to do that today is I'm going to show you, we're going to ask Chris questions about his principles about negotiation. And then I'm going to show you how I applied multiple principles that Chris has talked about into a ransomware negotiation that I conducted for a client where you don't get to talk to them, you don't get to see them, it's all done via email, and show you how his principles can really be helpful when the worst thing happens in our world is when we have a data breach, or even worse, a ransomware attack where they've encrypted your entire network. So Jody is gonna be a bit of an investigative reporter, ask Chris some questions, he's gonna explain to you some really important concepts from the black swan approach. And then I'm going to show you how I applied them in a ransomware negotiation for a client. Well, this will be fun because I did want to be a journalist early in my career. So I'm going to dust off those skills. And Chris, we always start every episode by trying to dive a little bit deeper into how people's career evolved to what they're doing today. So I did give some hints in your intro, but we'd love if you could share a bit more. Sure. Where, I mean, it's a long way from Mount Pleasant, Iowa, you know. <laughs> Where would you like me to start? Um, a little bit of how did you find yourself in the negotiation seat as you were and how and what the Black Swan Group does today? Yeah, well, I, you know, as an FBI agent, you become a hostage negotiator as an additional duty. And I found my way there because I'd been on SWAT. You know, I it just I was getting ready to leave the police department, KCMO, Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. I was on a list to go to the SWAT team. 
And then I got hired by the Bureau. And SWAT is typically an additional duty also. So I was on a SWAT team in the Pittsburgh office, my first assignment. Got rotated into New York, tried out for the Bureau's hostage rescue team, which is the FBI equivalent of the Navy SEALs. And in point of fact, a bunch of SEALs and Delta guys on that team. I uh, re-injured an old knee injury from my college days, martial arts, when I uh, tore my knee up and had it reconstructed. And I realized I couldn't do that very many more times. And so I thought, well, we got hostage negotiators. How hard could it be? I talk to people every day. And uh, the things that look simplest are often the most complicated and challenging and rewarding. Like as much as I love SWAT, I, hostage negotiation, communication, emotional intelligence, EQ, was far more interesting to me once I got into it. Volunteered on a suicide hotline. A couple opportunities came my way where I got to negotiate in sort of large-scale, unusual, rare events, bank robbery with hostages, and uh, just loved it and took initiative and instruction, ended up... Uh, Become a full time hostage negotiator, Quantico, you know, the legendary Quantico where lives are changed, and ended up in charge of all of our kidnapping response. And while I was learning that, I ended up collaborating with the Harvard folks, and they were very supportive and said, you know, it's the same thing. The stakes are different, but everybody negotiates as if it's the biggest thing in their life. And founded the Black Swan Group and wrote the book. and. Uh, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but those were the high points. Well, we appreciate it. So with that in mind, let's dive on in so we can leverage those principles that we have in our uh, ransomware situation. Does that sound good? I love it. I love it. All let's right. do it. Okay. So in a negotiation or just in daily life, people can react badly to questioning. What is labeling? And how does that diffuse tension? Yeah, that's a great question because you need to gather information, but asking questions is not the best way to gather information. For whatever reason, labels hit the brain in a way that causes you to feel the response is voluntary. You don't feel coerced. When you're questioned, you feel questions. When you ask questions, you feel questioned, and it, it diminishes rapport to some degree. And a label kind of hits the brain in the side door, and people just respond, even when they're tired. Labeling just lands better, and people are more likely to respond voluntarily without filtered uh, information to a label. Justin, what are your thoughts on labeling and diffusing tension as it relates to ransomware? So this is how I applied labeling that Chris talks about from his book in a ransomware negotiation. So much like Chris might have in his career, I get a phone call on a Sunday from somebody who I'm, I'm friendly and they're like, one of my clients has been ransomware. We don't know what to do. Can you help us? So I parachute into a situation where I don't know the client. I don't know anything that's going on. And we have an email address. So we send something to the email address, which is the threat actor's way of saying, hey, We've encrypted your network. If you want to get it back, you need to respond to us. And one of the things that Chris said, and we're trying to gather information is we'll ask the following kinds of questions. It seems, it sounds, it feels like. And one of the things that we were asking was, hey, it sounds like you're telling us we can't get access to our network. Can you provide us a proof of life so that if we're paying you this ransom, we know that we can get a decryption key that actually works? It's a proof of life. What I'm really doing in that is not trying to sound adversarial, but just having a conversation so that we can buy time because we have to figure out, do our backups work? Do Are we able to find some other way to get back up and running in a reasonable amount of time so that we don't have to pay the ransom because their initial offer to get the network back was half a million bucks. And let me do a little color commentary here as well. Please. Um, what you did uh, was ask a natural and normal question. And in any of these high stakes negotiations, you should never be afraid to ask a legitimate question. You ask a question which, and particularly around proof of life, which the other side is going to think to themselves, they're going to look at their partners and go, look, you know, that's a good question. That's a fair question to use the F-bomb. It's a legitimate question. 
And the proof of life issue, regardless of the circumstances, is, you know, if I do this, are you guys going to comply? You're not refusing to do it. You just, you know, like, hey, uh, how do we know that this is going to work if we do it? And it's a legitimate question. And that, that, that's, that's one of the brilliant aspects of this. Even if the other side seems to have all the leverage, quote, leverage, you still got some legitimate things to bring up as long as you're being respectful. And that's exactly how you did it. Chris, I'm curious, could you offer an example of a question that wouldn't be a natural question that you would advise perhaps instead we should say it differently? Uh, well, uh, uh, so a question that would be inappropriate, is, is that what you're asking me? Um, right, exactly? well, so if the idea is we don't want to label because we don't want to make the other side feel like that's what we're doing, and here a natural question would was okay, what would be an example of one that wouldn't be okay, that we don't want to, that most people might feel like that's an okay question to ask, but utilizing principles here would be no, actually, that probably wouldn't be as advised. Uh, I don't know that people, uh, an inappropriate question for the circumstances might be if you, if you asked, first of all, if you asked right away, that would have been a little bit blunt. I mean, you started, you started with a label that sort of softens it. It sounds, feels to the other side like you're being collaborative. Um, what would be a bad question? Uh, I can think of other ways to ask the same question and pitch it out. Uh, you know, a, ba a bad, if you'd come back with, you know, if you, what, what a lot of businesses do in these circumstances is, is start bargaining right away. You know, we can't possibly pay more than X. Um, you know, some, some sort of posturing nonsense. I mean, I've heard, of, I've heard of a lot of business executives come back with real stupid posturing nonsense or immediately making an offer that's inappropriate, making an offer that was inappropriate at this point in time, making an offer would be inappropriate. You got to feel that out a little bit. Okay. Well, so let's continue on in our negotiation here. So what does it mean in a negotiation to let no drip out slowly? Yeah. It, you should always put yourself in a position to be able to say no. Uh, the problem is if you're too blunt about it, if you say it too quickly. And the classic black swan, how am I supposed to do that? Which is, we used to put out as the first way of saying no, let out no a little at a time, never let the other side get caught off guard by a no. Uh, we re I originally thought of that as a way to telegraph to the other side that no was on its way. You know, the, uh, how am I supposed to do that in point of fact is an implementation question. And you're in a very deferential way communicating to the side is that there are implementation issues here. I mean, I kind of like to do it, you know, I'll, I'll be collaborative, but if I can't do it, it, it's, uh, it puts it out there much more gently, gets the other side thinking about it. So you, you let out know a little at a time. So the other side's not caught off guard by it. You're beginning to telegraph that there are issues on your side. It's not, a, it's not that you're being combative. You're actually being collaborative by letting out know a little at a time. So one of my, my, the phrase let out know a little at a time, I, a friend of mine, Ned Coletti, was the general manager for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they were ridiculously successful while Ned was the GM. And we're sitting around talking about it over, you know, steak and a couple of scotches one night. And he says, yeah, he says, I've learned that I, uh, an executive taught me to let out know a little at a time. So that's what it's about. You're collaborative. You're not smacking somebody in the face with no, but you're letting them know it might be on the way. All right. So, Justin, how does this apply in our scenario? So the way this applies in the ransomware scenario is within the next, I'd say, 36 hours, I find out from the uh, IT team that not only is the network completely encrypted, we have no backup, so we can't restore any of the data, the IT system is from like 2003. And unlike fine wine, IT systems don't get better with time. So it's going to have to be completely replaced. So what it means is, on top of that, they're like, yeah, we only have $100,000 or less to pay the ransom because we need money to rebuild our IT system. So now with that information that we have, what the threat actor does during that 36 hours, Chris, is he sends us a communication that says, if you guys don't pay us in the next 24 hours, there'll be no decrypt key. We're, you know, we're done. And what I learned was is what we responded and said, 
hey, wait a second. Um, how are we supposed to do this? We're not senior management. We don't have the authority to make that decision. Um, and so then they would respond, you have 24 hours, and they'll say, well, we know that you want to get paid in Bitcoin. How are we supposed to get Bitcoin for you when our company doesn't have any? And the point I want to make is those techniques, because I know it, it, it's a false deadline. The threat actors want to get paid. They really don't want to keep your data. They want to give you the decrypt key and get the money back. But I needed to stall for time to really get the lay of the land and know what I needed to do. And that's how we, in that context, using email only, were able to let out no slowly because I was trying to buy time to figure out what we were going to do. So, Chris, do you have any commentary on my approach? Do you see maybe a better way that we might have handled it? I'm happy to have an expert critique what I did. No, here's, here's why that was effective, and here's why that was the correct thing. All right, so yes, it's a false deadline. But on the other side, they got a timeline in mind. And you need, you need two things. You need to make them work for it. You know, when, when is the other side going to make a deal? When they feel like they've gotten everything they can. And the how questions are great questions because it put the burden of solving a problem back on a person who's causing it, which begins to exhaust them a little bit. And you want to make them feel like they worked really hard. Like if you give them what they want right away, they're not going to cut the deal. They're going to say, you know, that was too easy. I could get more. And so they're not going to, they're not going to let it go. You need, you need to emotionally work them into a position where they feel like they've earned every dollar. And you want to take them a little bit out of their game, out of their timeline, or take them to the end of their timeline without making them angry, without making them, uh, you know, go ballistic on them. Uh, so you, you're handling it beautifully at that point in time, and you're putting up some legitimate issues. You're not saying no, per se. Again, the how question is about implementation, and you're pointing out some implementation problems that you're going to have to work your way through. And so then you're creating, you've gone from an, uh, an adversarial relationship to forcing it to be a collaborative relationship. And once it's collaborative, then they feel invested in the process. And it's more likely that when the time comes to cut the deal and live up to their word, if you've made them feel like they worked hard enough for it, they're going to make the deal and they're going to move on. That's the critical issue is once you cut this deal, are they really going to stick to it? Because what, what are you going to do? You're going to sue them? You're going to give them a bad rating on Yelp? You know, you're going to give them, you're going to give them three stars on, on left? You know, you got you got no place to complain here. So you got to get them to the point where they felt like that they, they worked hard enough and they want to move on. It's funny you say that, Chris, because in my world, they now have ransomware as a service where you can go to customer service for the hackers on the dark web and get their help after they've encrypted your network. But that's just an aside. So Jody, it's a you highly take entrepreneurial world, right? You know, this is just entrepreneurs trying to trying to make a living. You got can't it. Be a hater can't be a hater. Nope. <laughs> They're very smart. Okay, so Chris, the Black Swan Group has some really particular thoughts when it comes out to throwing out numbers in a negotiation. Why would you want to propose a number like sixty nine thousand eight hundred and seventy six? It feels like a lot of effort went into it. It feels to the other side like it's a solid number. You start throwing out round numbers. <clears throat> it feels like you're bargaining, and there's a softness to the position. So when you put out really specific numbers down to the penny, it feels to them like you took a lot of time to come up with a really thoughtful, good, solid number. There's a lot of reasoning behind it. Plus, again, then the issue is time. Like if it took you that long to come up with that number. And I do, you know, I do have a time frame in mind. Every there's human nature is along the lines of what I refer to as DPO, duration, path, and outcome. Every human being in every endeavor thinks about how long it's going to take them to get what they want, duration, path, how am I going to get there? Outcome, what do I want? You know, ballpark, what am I hoping to settle for? DPO. And the other side, regardless of whether or not they're artificial deadlines, they got a time frame 
that they, they want to do this. Uh, kidnapping data is a business. Most likely the actor you're dealing with has got a boss. And the boss wants them to produce in a certain time frame and move on. So throwing out a very solid number begins to contribute to all these psychological dynamics that are what you need so that when the deal is cut, they agree, they comply, because you've got no other way to force them to comply. Dustin, how did you use this specific approach in your negotiation? So, Jody, I'm happy to share that, but I can't do it until you ask Chris the next question, because I had to use the combo of these two to get it done. Oh, okay. I didn't get that memo yeah. in our notes. <laughs> You, Chris, you named your company Black Swan. What is a Black Swan in the context of negotiation? Yeah, the Black Swan Group. Well, in about 2007, uh, I read a, a book by an author who I've become a very big fan of, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And his book was called The Black Swan. And he took borrowed the metaphor from 16th century Europe where they'd only seen white swans and they never thought a black swan was possible. And then they discovered him in Australia, and it's like, this changes everything. So in the context of a negotiation, black swans are the little pieces of information that change everything. The subtitle of Nicholas Taleb's book was uh, The Impact of the Highly Improbable. What are the little things that make all the difference in the world? So it's a combination of the information that you're picking up that change everything, and also the negotiation techniques you use that are subtle, the tiny little changes, two millimeter shifts, deference versus opposition. And it makes all the difference in the world. All right, Justin, what was your little piece of information that made the difference in the world that allowed you to give a very specific, unique number? So... When I was in the midst of my ransom negotiation, when I first got involved with this company, at the time I thought it was bad, but there was a trade publication from the industry sniffing around and they'd published multiple stories about this company and all the economic problems that they were having and whatnot. And it, initially it was a real struggle because I had to prep someone to talk to this reporter because the company made the decision they needed to talk to this reporter. And the first words out of their mouth was ransomware and cyber event. It was, Chris, an unmitigated disaster. However, if you recall, I said their demand was half a million dollars. The client said, we can't pay more than a hundred because we just don't have, we just can't. We have to rebuild our IT network. And right. so our Star Trek fans out there might be thinking, this is the Kobayashi Maru. This is the no-win scenario. But like Captain I love Kirk, Star Trek, by the way. But like Captain Kirk with Chris's techniques, I don't believe in the no win scenario. So here's what we did. The two principles that Chris just talked about was we took links to the articles that the about the company that they were having all these economic problems and put them in an email and said to the threat actor, basically, we understand what you're asking for. However, you're really trying to get money from a company that simply doesn't have the economic ability to pay that. What we can offer is $69,876. 20 minutes later, we got an email back. We'll take it. They gave us the decrypt key. And everybody thought, wow, this is the most amazing result. And the reason that we were able to get there, even though we were under time pressure, Chris, they also had a time period they were looking to get money. And once I showed them, they thought this was a rich company and it was really having economic problems. And they saw the articles. They were willing to take the money and run pretty quickly. And that's I didn't even realize at that point I was using a black swan principle with the with the article. But that's what we used and that's how it got done. And those are principles straight out of your book. Yeah, nice. Well done. Well done. So. Have any other black swan uh, nuggets of information you'd like to share? I have a few, but I'm more <laughs> interested in getting to our next question because this to me is a key one. Mm -hmm. Yes, Chris, right. I may get elbowed for this yes, one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yes, you might. Well, wait, when are you going to share the other funny story about, you know, the parking ticket? You, you want me to do that now? I don't know. You were all excited. I will. 
So Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about how you use your techniques when it comes to something like a parking ticket or when you go to hotel rooms and get upgrades? Because that one works really well too. Yeah, the hotel upgrade thing is great and um, use it on a regular basis. And I've experimented with it a little bit, you know, because as prescribed, it's pretty much a three-step process. And, you know, what I've really found is if you short circuit the process, the impact is not as good. Like, you know, we start out effectively with an accusations audit and you actually takes, uh, do some emotional anchoring. You prepare the person on the other side for a horrific interaction. And then you sort of gently make it better and better and better until you've got an ask, uh, you know, how much trouble do I get you in if I, if I ask for a complimentary upgrade to a suite? You know, uh, that's uh, uh, sort of a two-part thought uh, constructing question my son Brandon Voss came up with. And I have s a couple of times tried to short circuit the process. And just ask a question right off the bat. And one of the last hotels I was in, I said, you know, how much of a jerk do I seem like? How much trouble do I get you in if I ask you for a complimentary upgrade to a suite? And I saw that it didn't land as effectively if I'd have taken the time to take them on a journey, which is only a few minutes longer, but it was late and I was tired and I'm playing around with this. And it made me realize, you know, the emotional journey you take people on gently and leaving them better than you found them. Uh, it, it, you, you know, you got to take the time to do it right. It takes longer to do it over than it takes to do it right. And in point of fact, in this instance, you know, I didn't get the upgrade. I don't know that I would have. But for often, if they don't get the upgrade, there's other stuff that I might want. And I cut myself off by, by not uh, going through the whole process. So. And the hotel suite upgrades is, you know, take the time, follow the process, follow the steps. You're the only one that it shortchanges if you don't. Because I want to share with our listeners, I use Chris's technique to call the parking company when I got a ticket because I stayed five minutes over and I said, I know I'm calling. I know I'm going to sound like a pain in the ass and what I'm asking for, but I was five minutes over. It's my wife's car. It's a new car. Is there any way you can help me so I don't have to go home and face the wrath of my wife the wrath of the titans huh? <laughs> say that was the way you were gonna say on this podcast well <laughs> hey but i got out of it and i didn't have to get up i didn't have to get my co-host upset because it was her car i was using <laughs> <laughs> great you were the hostage you, no, you were you were a hostage and you were looking for the parking ticket person and for you 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 made him the hero nice uh, okay, we're going to move on now. You did not <laughs> warn me of that one. Uh, Am I asking? I, I thought I'm still a reporter. I want you to ask this okay. next question. All right. So, Chris, you are a big proponent of tone in your voice in recognition. In See, look at what you did. You laughed, so I got all off track, so now I have to start again. Okay. <laughs> Justin is very focused on tone, which is why I'm laughing so hard, because I feel like that's what we hear with two girls and myself all day. Tone is very high in our house. You, mm. so Chris, you are a big proponent of tone in your voice in a negotiation. So what is the cool late night DJ voice and how can negotiators develop better awareness of their tone? Yeah, the late night FM DJ voice is just downward inflecting all the way down to the um, course of what you say. I mean, it lends authority to your voice. I mean, you gotta, there's a couple of nuances to be careful of. You don't want to be cold. It's very close to the analyst's natural voice, but the analyst tends to come off as cold and distant. So you want to be conscious of being cold. You want to be conscious of being condescending. It's very close to a condescending voice, but there are notes in a condescending voice that come out in terms of inflect, inflection. Uh, um, intention has is contagious, and if your intention is to be calming and soothing and reassuring, then that's what that voice is. And there's a there's a neural chemical response, an involuntary response. Well, it works with the other side. It's they don't make a choice to be calmed down. They are calmed down. Now they can fight it, uh, but you can kick the process into gear 
regardless. And so that's the beginning. And there, some people, Sandy Hine, uh, who is a coach on my team, says, well, women got to be careful, sound and seductive. And that, that is an issue that men don't have to face. But women also, if they have a higher voice, all they have to do is drop their chin when they talk. You can force your voice to downward inflect by dropping your chin as you speak. And it will it will be a downward inflection in the tonality of the voice. And it has a tendency to be very reassuring, very calming, especially when the other side's upset. Depending upon the nature of the interaction, people are often anxious, concerned, upset. And the late night FM DJ voice does a lot to help smooth that out. Sometimes people wonder what we talk about at our house around our dinner table. I can tell that you're going to tell your daughters to try lowering their chin to help yep. their tone of voice. I can see that conversation happening this weekend. Uh, it might, but <laughs> I guess, Chris, what I wanted you to give the audience a feel for is another way to use the inflection is for our audience, Chris, is we'll be negotiating a contract. And one of the clauses that happens often is a, con a concept that says, hey, if you have a security interest incident, like a data breach, you're going to have unlimited liability, which is a really big potential problem in contract negotiation. Yeah. And so what I did was, is I was playing with it about how to nicely say that cold day in hell before that's happening. And what, we, what I came up with is, is a concept that you have, which is, you say back to the other party, you say, well, in your contracts with your customers, if you were to cause a data breach for them, you wouldn't take on unlimited liability, would you? And what I'm saying is, is I've learned through time, it's the inflection in my voice at the end there, which I think you teach, that I ask it as a question. So I'm in a nice way telling them, you wouldn't agree to that. Why are you asking us to? And when I did it, the lawyer on the other side said, I have to plead the fifth when I knew I had him. And then mm -hmm. the negotiation went away from that. But I just wanted to have you give a feel for how you use that in the context to make what could have been a very tension-filled clause. We made it kind of funny into a joke and they got our point and we were able to successfully bridge the gap. Yeah, and there, there, actually there's some more there too that's really good because basically you're driving for a no there instead of trying to get somebody to say yes. And it's uh, you wouldn't do that, would you? Yeah. Uh, is and people feel safer with a no to begin with. Uh, they feel a little more protected. So they, they feel less corn. They feel less attacked. So the, the the word choice there is really good. And then again, you could. It would be easy to say, you know, you wouldn't accept unli unlimited liability, would you? And that would sound that tone of voice, which you would be tempted by, would be saying like, "You're an idiot. This is stupid." But and instead, the inquisitive tone of voice, inquiring, you know, upward inflection, and and that lands. Uh, it feels deferential, and you can get away with saying stuff that way. That the other way just feels like an accusation. It feels like hey, you got to watch out for contempt, disdain. But when you're dropping it like that, it just lands and. Right. Extremely well done on choice of inflection. And the reason I wanted to point it out to you, Chris, that I'll share with our audience is in the past, I'd had trouble. Sometimes you negotiate with people who either intentionally or that's just their negotiating style. They're tough on a variety of points and a way to wear you, wear you down. And if you lose your temper or you make it clear that you're being disdainful, you really get nothing out of it. And I guess... Do you have a sense for how long people have to work at it in general? It's not like you just read your book and in two weeks, voila, you're changed. You really have to practice this over time. Do you have a sense from your um, experience as to how long our viewers would have to be implementing your principles before they could really start to see it sink in for them? Yeah, well, there's two trigger points. Uh, and one that I would refer to as four repetitions and the other one that I would refer to as 63 or 64 repetitions. Now, a new skill who that seems very different from anything that you've done, you know, your fear centers, your amygdala fires, you bring it to imagine all these ways what won't work. And what you really need to do is give your supercomputer, your intuition, which is a supercomputer, enough uh, 
experiential data to assess. And if it's an inflection, if it's a no warranty question, if it's a label, I say, look, do it four times. Just do it as I prescribed it, just four times. Now, after four executions, you're going to start to give your gut instinct enough data to go like, oh, wow, this actually does work. And so now you're encouraged. You haven't, you haven't wired it into your brain yet, but you've given your supercomputer, your intuition, actual data to assess and say, yeah, well, you know, it, it worked every time. It worked really well three out of four times, and one time it was medium. But that's enough data to be encouraged. Now, how do you build it into your wiring? And I listened to a guy named John Foley talk a number of years ago. He's a former Blue Angel pilot, and he talked about grooving a skill into your brain. The Blue Angels, you know, they're flying at Mach 1, uh, three feet apart, wingtip to wingtip. If they make a, if their learning skills up in the air, they get killed. So they had to wire the skills into their brain before they went up in the sky. And he said 63 to 64 repetitions. And perfect practice makes perfect. So you're not doing it fast. You're taking your time to make sure you do it as prescribed. And somewhere around 63 to 64 tries, now it's wired into the brain. And it's a much more of an automatic habit. So the two trigger points are four times to give yourself enough data. 63 to 64 times now it's a habit that's really very very interesting i i can't wait to share that with our daughters tonight uh, <laughs> it took me months of doing this well four times stuff. of practice just, and then 63 it to 64 took a while and you have to stick with it you just anyway so chris what is your best negotiation tip that you might share with our audience of privacy professionals and security pros Look, if you, if you do the highly inefficient thing to take the time to hear the other side out, the net acceleration on the deal is going to be astonishing and is going to save you a lot of time. That seems very inefficient and ineffective to make sure you hear the other side out fully at the beginning. Why can't we just get to the point? The answers here are obvious. Why waste time? You know, with all this hearing each other out nonsense, it just puts an accelerant in the entire relationship that saves you massive amounts of time. So the highly inefficient feeling practice of fully hearing the other side out is accelerates everything and makes your deals go much more smoothly. And Chris, when you are not helping people and companies become better negotiators. What do you like to do for fun? Well, I, you know, I, lo I love spontaneity and travel um, at, at some point in time. So, you know, if I can get on some sort of an adventure to an interesting and different place where we don't know quite for sure what, what's going to happen, then that's kind of my favorite thing. Uh, I used to have a mo motorcycle. I, I don't have one now. I, I jump on a bike and take it for a ride, not knowing where I was going. But uh, spontaneity and adventure to me is a lot of fun. So where was your last fun travel trip? Last time I jumped on a bike, uh, I didn't know where I was going. I ended up in Pennsylvania at different crossroads. The original plan was to go straight. I'm sitting there at the crossroad, and I just went right instead. And I got a great tour of Pennsylvania and ended up some places I didn't expect to be. In. And Chris, if people would like to learn more about you, the Black Swan Group, where should they go? Well, yeah, what they should do is, and I'll share the link for you to sign up for our newsletter, The Edge. Now, our website is blackswanltd.com, B-L-A-C-K-S-W-A-N-L-T-D.com. Our newsletter is complimentary. It's actionable. It's kind of the gateway to everything, all the different stuff that we have. And you get an email to your inbox at, on a Tuesday morning about 730. You know, you got Monday behind you. And it's complimentary, but it's valuable because it's actionable and they're negotiating tips that you could use that day. In it. If you sign up on the link that I'm going to give you guys, um, what you do is you get a free PDF of our top 10 no-oriented questions. And 
you guys, you know, you asked an oriented question. You wouldn't do this, would you? I mean, that's a no-oriented question. And they can be ridiculously effective switching from yes to no. And we coach people so much in that. We say, well, let's go ahead and give them the top 10 most applicable no-oriented questions across the board so you can get your reps in. You know, we'll, we'll help you script the no-oriented questions that you could start. And then uh, so you get a nice start with us by uh, subscribing via this link and then we can help you get better along a lot of other fronts as well. That is amazing. And thank you. And for everyone listening, we'll make sure that we have that in the show notes. So be sure to come back to the site and check it out. Well, Chris, thank you so very much. Justin, do you have any closing words for us? I'm a big fan of the YouTube content that you do. I've learned a ton from doing it. So obviously, uh, I'm a homer for Chris because I use this stuff and I thought the audience could benefit from it. That's amazing. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was a lot of fun. Well, thank you again, Chris. We're so grateful. All right. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time. Oh,